Hey, Nadav, if you're ready, um, uh, are, are you ready? Yep. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, we're happy to have Nadav Cohen here to talk to us about um, the dynamics of gradient descent for learning neural networks. So take it away. Thanks a lot, Adam. Just please let me know if at any point in time there's some problem with the connection or anything like that. Uh, just so that I'll try to adapt. So thanks a lot for the invitation. Really happy to be here. I will talk today about analysis of optimization, generalization, and deep learning uh, through dynamics of gradient descent. I'll start by um, setting the stage, laying out the case that I will try to make today. Okay. So um, optimization in the basic supervised learning uh, setup, we, when we talk about optimization, we typically mean the process of minimizing some objective, some loss function in order to fit training data. And generalization refers to controlling the gap between the train and test errors, for example, by adding some regularization term to the objective. And optimization and generalization behave in deep learning very differently from how they behave in classical machine learning. So let's reflect for a moment about that. So in classical machine learning, not exactly a well-defined term, but you can think of linear models, SVM, Adaboost, things like that. Uh, basically, we start off from um, the principle of making our objectives or training objectives convex. Okay? We choose uh, models in a way that will ensure that the objective is convex. So typically, it has just one global minimum, and usually it's sufficiently attainable. And the choice of algorithm, choice of optimization algorithm, that affects the speed at which you reach this global optimum. But it doesn't matter in terms of the which solution you will ultimately reach. In generalization, we have the well-known bias variance trade-off, which roughly speaking states that if you add on more regularization, then the gap between train and test errors uh, goes down. That's a good thing. On the other hand, the training error goes up, which is a bad thing. And vice versa, if I lessen the regularization, then the gap opens up, which is a bad thing, but the train error goes down, which is a good thing. So there's a trade-off here, and I think um, most would agree that we have a fairly decent understanding of what's going on here. In deep learning, the situation is very, very different. Um, we allow the objectives to be non-convex. We give up this requirement of convexity. And now there's not just one global minimum. There are a lot of them. And a priori, it's not clear that any of them is efficiently attainable. But somehow, variants of gradient descent, which is probably the simplest first order optimization algorithm, uh, somehow, in practice, managed to reach one of these global minima. And in terms of generalization, the situation is even more peculiar. Uh, we pretty much know for a fact that some global minima generalize well, while others don't. And for some reason, on typical problems, just to say the problems that deep learning works for, for some reason, gradient descent often finds a solution that generalizes well. And maybe most surprisingly is that there seems to not be a bias variance trade-off. The huge models, highly over-parameterized, uh, generalize well. And even when we don't um, impose any explicit regularization, the way we view this is as an implicit regularization that is induced by the optimizer. So the optimizer matters a lot in terms of the performance, of in terms of the generalization. Okay, there's not a separation as there was uh, in the classical case. And most would agree that we don't really understand uh, these questions sufficiently well. And the argument that I am trying to make is that maybe the language that was developed over the years for understanding classical learning theory, maybe that's just not sufficient for understanding what goes on in deep learning. And in that case, maybe we should look at what goes on during learning, okay? And specifically the trajectories, the dynamics of optimization, the dynamics of gradient descent. And this is the case that I will try to make today, and I will do this by analyzing deep linear neural networks. Okay. So now let's move on and uh, talk about the actual uh, content. This is based on 
uh, four papers in the last couple of years. First three were done at Princeton with Sanjeev Barora and Nath Hazan and students Wei Hu, Yuping Lua, and Noah Golowich. And the last uh, paper was with my student, Norm Razin, at uh, Tel Aviv University. So what's a linear neural network? A linear neural network, that's a fully connected neural network with linear activation or no activation. It's just a linear mapping that is parameterized as a sequence of matrix multiplications. So from a representational perspective, this model is trivial, only realizes linear mappings. But when you run gradient descent over this model, over this parametrization, then you're basically uh, facing a highly non-convex problem, highly non-convex objective. And the optimization is non-trivial and neither is generalization, and we will see this. And for these reasons, this model is viewed as a theoretical surrogate for nonlinear uh, deep neural networks, and it's really studied extensively. Yeah, this is just a sample of papers uh, from the last few years. So what we are going to do is analyze the dynamics of gradient descent over linear neural networks, and then we're going to use this analysis to draw conclusions on optimization and generalization. So let's start the dynamical analysis. Um, a technical tool that we will make use of is gradient flow. This is a continuous version of gradient descent. That's what you get when you take the step size to be infinitesimally small. This is a differential equation. If gradient descent in these discrete steps, gradient flow would be this continuous curve. And the reason it is useful is because it allows you to use various mathematical tools from differential geometry, differential equations, continuous mathematics, basically. And the results that you derive can then be translated to gradient descent with a positive step size. Again, we're gonna see this today and there's actually an ongoing work on this generic translation that um, will be out soon. So we will analyze, we'll start by analyzing the dynamics of gradient flow over linear neural networks. Okay, the kind of objectives that we will look at have the following structure. Suppose we have a loss L over a linear model. So this is typically convex. You can think of this as um, logistic loss or L2. And this kind of loss induces an over-parameterized objective over a linear neural network, okay, which is phi here. So it's phi at the point W1 to Wn, the value of the objective there you want to compute it, you just take the matrices, multiply them by one another, and plug it into the original loss. Okay, so what we're going to study is gradient flow over objectives of this form, over these over-parameterized objectives. Okay. A simple fact that's really easy to, um, to see, I'm not going to show it here, but please believe me, is that the trajectories of gradient flow uh, conserve different quantities. Specifically, there are quantities that stay constant through time. And these quantities are what's written here. It's the weight matrix of layer J plus one transpose times itself. The difference between that and the weight matrix of layer J times its transpose. These things are fixed throughout time. And so the trajectories that gradient flow takes are not just arbitrary. They have certain properties, in particular, conserved quantities. And this kind of observation uh, leads to, naturally leads to a definition, which is balancedness. We say that the weights are balanced if these quantities uh, are all, the conserved quantities are all equal to zero, meaning if the weight matrix of layer J plus one transpose times itself, that thing is equal to the weight matrix of layer J times its transpose. And that's um, the definition of balancedness. And combining this with the above fact, we get the following result, and that is that if the weights are balanced at initialization, they stay that way throughout, throughout the entire optimization path. Okay? Why is this relevant to practice? Because in practice, the kind of initializations that we usually use are either approximately balanced or exactly balanced. If we initialize the weights to be very small, then we are approximately balanced. And that's going to remain the situation throughout the entire optimization path. And if we initialize to identity, which is kind of linear resnets, then balancedness holds exactly. Okay, so under standard initialization schemes, 
uh, balancedness either holds approximately or exactly throughout the entire optimization trajectory. And this is going to be very useful for answering the following question. When we run gradient flow over a linear neural network, okay, over this overparameterized objective, then at every point in time, there is an equivalent end-to-end -end model. We call this the end-to-end -end matrix. Okay, that's just a product of all the layer-wise weight matrices. And that thing moves in space when we run gradient flow over a linear neural network. And what we ask is, how does the end-to-end -end matrix move in space? It follows some dynamics. What are these dynamics? They are not gradient flow over the original loss L because we didn't run gradient flow over the original loss L. We over-parameterized and ran gradient flow on the linear network. So how does the end-to-end -end matrix move? Apparently, it moves as follows. If the weights are balanced at initialization, then the end-to-end -end matrix follows what we call the end-to-end -end dynamics and this is what's written here in the equation that I'm uh, pointing to right now. Okay? So if you ignore the blue term here, then this is just gradient flow over the original loss L. VEC means to arrange a matrix as a vector. So it doesn't matter. It's meaningless if you don't have the blue term here. That would mean that the end-to-end -end matrix just follows gradient flow. This blue term, that is what encompasses the fact that we use the linear neural network. It, everything boils down to this blue term, and that is a preconditioner. It's a PSD matrix. It's a certain kind of preconditioner that depends on the end-to-end -end matrix. So it depends on where we are in parameter space. We have a closed form expression for it. It's written here. Please don't try to parse this. I'm just showing it so that you get a sense that it's not that complicated. Uh, intuitively speaking, what this preconditioner does is it promotes movement in directions that you've already taken. And more specifically, those directions in space that those singular directions that have a large singular value in the end-to-end -end matrix, the gradient in these directions is going to be stretched more. And vice versa, the singular directions that have a small, sorry, a small singular value, uh, the gradient is going to be attenuated in those directions. So if I start off near zero and I start moving in space, those directions in which I've moved a lot, the gradient will be stretched more in these directions. So there's some kind of a momentum effect here. And the relation to momentum can actually be formalized. Bottom line is that if I add on seemingly redundant linear layers and then run gradient descent, effectively what I have done is induced a precondition a specific kind of preconditioner that promotes movement in directions uh, that have already been taken. And this result is going to facilitate um, everything that we're going to see on optimization and generalization, and we're going to see pretty surprising conclusions. Okay? So just a word before uh, we start, something that will hint to the fact that this kind of preconditioner is not something that you can necessarily think of in standard terms. So we have the end-to-end -end dynamics here. It turns out that if the original loss L, which we think of as convex, if it doesn't have a critical point at zero, meaning if it doesn't have a global minimum at zero, then there exists no function whose gradient gives you this expression here, okay, this vector field. That means that I cannot write the end-to-end -end dynamics as gradient flow over some kind of objective. I cannot modify the objective, run gradient flow, and hope to get the same kind of dynamics. It's mathematically impossible. Okay, so the dynamics of gradient flow over linear neural network can't be emulated by modifying your objective or regularizing it or anything like that. Okay, the way that you prove this is you just show that the vector field here contradicts the gradient theorem. Okay, the gradient theorem tells us that the line integral of a gradient of a vector field that is a gradient, its line integral over any closed curve is zero. So we can construct curves over which the line integral of this vector field is non-zero. Therefore, they cannot be the gradient of anything. Okay, so this is just kind of an interesting uh, anecdote. What we're going to do now is start um, studying optimization and generalization using the dynamical analysis. 
um, we will start with optimization. And before we get to the dynamical analysis, just a word about kind of a, the conventional approach, or at least something that until recently was uh, conventional. And that is to look at the geometry of the objective, and specifically the geometry of critical points. Make points where the gradient is zero. So there are different types of critical points. Could have a local minimum. The local minimum could be good, meaning that the objective value is close to the global minimum. Local minimum could be bad, so the objective is um, much higher. You could have a saddle. It could be strict, meaning that the Hessian has negative eigenvalues, so there are directions of significant descent. Or the saddle could be non-strict, so it's very flat. And formally, the Hessian doesn't have any negative eigenvalues. So a result that was proven um, in different flavors by different groups is that if you don't have any bad local minimum and you don't have any non-strict saddles, okay, so no points like this, no points like this, then basically gradient descent will eventually converge to global minimum. And so this is pretty encouraging, right? I could hope to prove convergence to global minimum just by looking at the geometry of the objective, I don't have to worry about the complicated interplay between the algorithm and the objective. And indeed, many have looked at these uh, properties, have studied local minima or the non-strict set or the strict saddle property, and managed to prove this way convergence for shallow models, two layers. This approach kind of hits a wall when you go beyond two layers. If you go to three layers or more, even with the simplest models like linear nets. If you have three or more layers, then the second derivatives, for example, at the origin, when all the weights are zero, all the second derivatives will be zero. So the hashing will be zero. And therefore, unless this is some kind of local optimum, then it will be a non-strict saddles. And it usually is. In this interesting case, it is. So property two is just false. It's not met. So you can't really go very far with this approach if you want to analyze convergence for three or more layer models. And what we do is turn to our dynamical analysis. And so this is the implicit preconditioning. This is the end-to-end -end dynamics. Something that's easy to show is that if the end-to-end -end matrix is full rank, then the preconditioner is going to be full rank as well. It's going to be positive definite. And therefore, it will not kill this gradient. Okay? It will not zero it out. And therefore, the loss is going to continue to decrease until one of two things happen, or at least one of two things. Number one, the gradient um, is zero, and then movement will stop, the gradient of the original loss. Or maybe the gradient is non-zero, but somehow the preconditioner killed it. And that's only possible if the end-to-end -end matrix is singular. We typically think of the original loss as convex. As I said, it's L2 or logistic regression. Um, so one, the gradient of this loss being zero, that means that I've reached global minimum. And so I end up with the following uh, corollary, basically. And that is that if the loss is convex, the original one, and the linear network is initialized such that the weights are balanced, and the loss at initialization is smaller than the loss of any singular matrix. So by going down, I'm never going to hit singularity. Under these two conditions, gradient flow will converge to global minimum. Okay, so I have a convergence to global minimum for gradient flow under two assumptions on initialization. Obviously, there's no notion here of um, computational efficiency, right? Because this is gradient flow. It's a continuous algorithm. What we do is translate it to gradient descent, translate the result. So this is the result we had for gradient flow. And now I'm going to rewrite it. Okay? Just same thing, but I'll write it a little bit differently. First of all, instead of saying that the loss of initialization is smaller than the loss of any singular matrix, I'll say that it's smaller than the loss of any matrix that has a zero singular value. Same thing. And secondly, instead of saying that the weights are balanced, I'll write the definition of balanceness. Okay? These terms need to be equal to zero. And then instead of saying that they're equal to zero, I'll say that their norms, the Frobenius norms are equal to zero. So up to this point, I didn't change anything. And now we're gonna translate this to a theorem for gradient descent. And so this theorem specifically, uh, we prove it for L2 loss, it can be extended to any strongly convex and smooth loss. 
And what we do is strengthen the first assumption on initialization. Instead of requiring that the loss be better than the loss of any matrix that has a zero singular value, we require a little bit more. It needs to be better than the loss of any matrix that has a singular value that's smaller than C. And C is a free parameter that you can do. Okay, so slightly stronger requirement. And on the other hand, we slightly relax the requirement for balancedness. We don't require the norms to be zero. They are now allowed to be smaller than something that scales like C squared. Under these two assumptions, gradient descent with a step size that scales like C to the fourth um, converges to global optimum exponentially fast. This is linear rate convergence. It's E to the minus constant times T times iteration number. So for arbitrarily deep models, arbitrarily wide models, if you initialize and meet these two assumptions, you will converge to global optimum exponentially fast. Okay. What can we say about these assumptions? It all boils down to them, eventually. And first thing we know is that they are both, in some sense, necessary. And that means that you can't just eliminate any of them. You might be able to weaken them. But if you throw away one of them, doesn't matter which, then it's easy to come up with counterexamples where convergence fails or things can even diverge. So you can't hope to throw away any of them. Second thing we know is that for the case of output dimension one, the scalar regression, if you use an initialization that's similar to the standard one, but a little bit different, we call it balanced initialization, use this, then the assumptions will be met with constant probability. And constant means close to 0.5. So use this kind of initialization, no assumptions at all, probability 0.5 or more, you will get linear rate convergence to global optimum. Okay, so Adam, I, I have a question. Yep. Um, yeah. So about the, the green assumption, I mean, it yeah. seems to me, maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but it seems to me like a strong assumption about the, the features or the relation of the, if I think of a standard machine learning, like I have the XI and the YI, if there is some coordinate of the XI that doesn't matter to predict YI, then I could imagine a singular W that, that will be optimal, like, you know, which would just ignore one of the coordinates of the X. And so how can you at initialization be better than this? I, I okay, that. so this is a good question. So first of all, if the scalar regression, in the case of scalar regression, then the end-to-end -end matrix, that's a vector, and singular means zero. So you only need to be better than zero. So in that case, and that's why the probability is close to half. You just need to fall on the right side of zero. So, okay, it, it's... Oh, I see, I get it, I get it. I, okay, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, okay. Okay, so I, I think there was a misunderstanding, but okay, cool. Uh, all right, so, so we have a guarantee of efficient convergence to global minimum for arbitrarily deep and wide models. And this is not these kind of ultra wide neural networks. It's for efficient, models that you can run, optimize efficiently, everything can fit into your computer. And in that sense, it's one of the most general guarantees that I'm aware of. Okay. And this was possible due to the dynamical viewpoint. We managed to go beyond the classical landscape approach. What we're going to see now is something that I think attests even more to the importance of a dynamical view. And that is the effect of depth on optimization. And so we're used to thinking that convex optimization is easier than non-convex. That means that optimizing a linear model is easier than a deep network. What we're going to see is that this is not always the case. Okay. So here's our end-to-end -end dynamics. This is in the discrete, um, in discrete form. This is the implicit precondition. And what we can show is that for any p greater than 2, there exist settings with the LP loss, that's a convex loss, where the end-to-end -end dynamics reach global minimum arbitrarily faster than gradient descent. So I can construct a data set for any P greater than two with the LP loss, such that end-to-end -end dynamics will converge as faster as I'd like compared to gradient descent. And this means that there are cases where you could optimize a linear model on a convex loss, okay? And if instead you 
non-convexify your problem by using a linear network, you would actually converge much faster. This is, this is not intuitive. However, it's a theoretical result. I'm just saying that there exists cases like this and the proof carefully constructs these weird data sets. And the question is, how often does this happen in practice? So for that, we run experiments. Uh, I'll show here just the most basic one. We ran a lot of experiments. This is just, again, the simplest one. This is a data set from a UCI machine learning repository. We use L4 loss. And this is what you get when you compare a one layer model. That's the blue line. This is convex. You compare that to a two layer model and a three layer model. These are non-convex. And you can see that the loss goes down much faster. This is log scale on the y-axis here. And so depth can actually speed up gradient descent, even when it doesn't give you anything in terms of expressiveness, and despite the fact that it introduces non-convexity. In any setting we tried with L4 loss or LPP greater than two, this phenomenon happened. And it also happens with nonlinear nets. And we ran some experiments on that as well, where you take a fully connected layer in a nonlinear net, just replace it by a sequence of matrix multiplications, a sequence of linear layers, and it gives you a significant speed up. And this idea has actually already made its way to practical applications. This is from um, the past NeurIPS. This is a state-of-the-art super resolution system. It uses again. Won't go to, to the details of this work. Just say that they use the idea of over-parametrization with a deep linear net in order to drastically accelerate convergence in optimization. And this is a quote from the paper. We found that using a deep linear net is dramatically superior, and that's consistent with recent findings in theoretical deep learning. And so this kind of conclusion that sometimes non-convexity helps is something that I don't think you can do with the standard convex optimization viewpoint. And the dynamical approach allowed us to reach this kind of conclusion. Okay. Now let's move on to generalization. We're going to look here at a setting that um, where generalization carries a very concrete meaning, and that is matrix completion. We want to recover a low rank matrix given a subset of its entries. Famous example is the Netflix prize uh, that everybody knows about. So if I denote the observations by Bij, where Ij ranges over some index set, set of observed indices, then what I would like to do is minimize the rank subject to agreeing with the observations. I want to find the minimal rank among all the matrices that agree with the observations. This is a computationally hard problem. There is a convex programming approach, a convex relaxation, and that is to replace the rank by the nuclear norm. The nuclear norm is obviously convex. And now what I do is minimize the nuclear norm subject to agreeing with the observations. And a result which is somewhat surprising but well known these days is that this actually gives you perfect reconstruction if you have enough observations. And this if is important, and we're going to see this. A deep learning approach, which we call deep matrix factorization, deep learning approach to matrix completion, is to parameterize the solution as a linear neural net and just run gradient descent. And so we parameterize, we represent the solution as a sequence of matrix multiplications. We don't constrain the rank in any way. We don't constrain the hidden dimensions, so there's no explicit regularization. And we just run gradient descent over the resulting loss, which is square difference from the observations. That's it, run gradient descent on this. So this setting was uh, studied by Gunasekar et al. a few years ago. They looked at uh, depth two. And what they showed empirically is that this often gives you an accurate reconstruction. So there's some kind of implicit regularization here. And they conjectured that under the hood, gradient descent converges to the minimum nuclear norm solution. So in fact, what goes on here under the hood is the convex programming approach that we saw in the previous slide. And they were able to prove this thing for this conjecture for a very kind of certain specific uh, case. And we were interested in studying the setting when you have depth, and in particular, trying to extend the nuclear norm, uh, the proof of the nuclear norm conjecture. And the first thing we did was run experiments. And so we compare gradient descent over a linear neural network. We compare that to 
uh, the minimum nuclear norm solution. So this is what you see here. This is matrix completion. Left plot shows you reconstruction error. Right plot shows you nuclear norm. And what you see on the x-axis, that's the number of observations. So every tick on the x-axis is a different experiment. It's matrix completion with a different number of observations. And you see here the final solution when you use a two-layer linear net, a three-layer linear net, and when you use the minimum nuclear norm minimization, okay, the nuclear norm minimization, sorry. As expected, when you have many observations, the minimum nuclear norm solution is very close to the grand truth. Okay? And what we also see is that the linear nets converge to the grand truth. So in particular, they converge to the minimum nuclear norm solution because that is the grand truth. So everything just coincides here. However, when you have a small number of observations, the minimum nuclear norm solution is far from the grand truth. You can see a high reconstruction error. And then the linear nets have to make a choice. Will they minimize the rank or the nuclear norm? And they choose to minimize the rank. And even more so with the deeper model, three layers in this, four layers, five layers, it's even stronger, the um, bias towards low rank. So the bottom line here is that empirically, it seems that the linear nets gave up on nuclear norm minimization in favor of minimizing the rank. And this effect is enhanced with depth. So we want to be able to explain this. It seems that the minimum nuclear norm approach doesn't really pan out. And again, we turn to our dynamical analysis. And this is the end-to-end -end dynamics. In green, that's the end-to-end -end matrix. And what we can show is we can characterize the movement of singular values of the end-to-end -end matrix. And so we denote by sigma r, these are the singular values of the end-to-end -end matrix. U, r, v, r, these are the corresponding left and right singular vectors. Here is a characterization of the dynamics of the singular values. Please don't try to parse this. We will get to this in a couple of slides. For now, just know that we can characterize the dynamics of singular values. A corollary of this, which is important right now, is the following. If you have depth two or more, which means if it's a non-trivial model, if it's not just a linear uh, model, then the determinant of the end-to-end -end matrix does not change sign. It maintains its sign. And even this seemingly benign observation of determinant not changing sign has far-reaching implications. And this is what we're going to see now. Okay. So this is the corollary. Determinant doesn't change sign. Now consider the following matrix completion problem. Very simple. I'm trying to complete a two by two matrix. I see all observations with the top left, and it looks like this. Let's think about the solution space for this problem and how, which solution you need to go to if you want to minimize different quantities. So it turns out, and it's not difficult to show, that if you want to minimize a Shatton P norm or a Shatton P quasi norm, this is a broad class of norms and quasi norms, as special cases that includes nuclear, Frobenius, spectral norms. Minimizing any of them requires taking the unobserved entry to zero. If you want to minimize some norm, it doesn't matter which, anything, or quasi-norm, then the unobserved entry needs to be finite. However, if you want to minimize the rank, you actually need to take the unobserved entry to infinity. Because strictly speaking, every solution to this matrix completion problem has rank two. But you can approach rank one by taking the unobserved entry to infinity. So what you see here is that the problem entails a contradiction between minimizing norms and minimizing rank. If there is an implicit regularization here, at play, it'll have to make a choice. It can't both minimize norms and minimize rank. And the fact that the determinant does not change sign means that if you initialized with a positive determinant and you fit the observations, the only way in which this could happen Fitting the observations with a positive determinant is if the unobserved entry goes to infinity. And this is actually what happens, okay? Both in theory, as we just now saw, and in practice, this is the unobserved entry as a function of the loss. The loss gets smaller, unobserved entry goes up. This is just a simple instance of this phenomenon and happens in various other cases as well. Bottom line here is that there are settings where the implicit regularization of linear nets drives all norms to infinity. So norms cannot give us the answer. 
So what we do in order to try and gain a better understanding is again, go back to our dynamical analysis and specifically the characterization of singular value dynamics, which is what you see here. The movement of a singular value is equal to some factor times the projection of the gradient on the corresponding singular component. Okay, so let's try and interpret this thing. First thing to notice is that given the end-to-end -end matrix, the effect of capital N, which is the depth of my model, the depth of my linear net, that affects the dynamics only through these ground factors. These are the only things that manifest the depth. If the depth is equal to one, that's a classic linear model, then all the factors reduce to one and they just, they're, they're not existent. Okay? Once you add depth, these factors start coming into play. And what are these factors? I just multiply the movement of a singular value by itself to the power of something. And that's something, that power grows with n. So deeper models give you a higher power here. And these factors, therefore, they speed up the movement of large singular values and they attenuate the movement of small ones. And this becomes more and more significant the more layers you have. So if I start off near zero, then I'd expect all singular values to move very, very slowly. And then once a singular value reaches some critical threshold, it'll start moving quickly. And then another one maybe will pass the threshold and start moving quickly. And I will end up with a small set of large singular values and all the rest will be close to zero. So this is kind of a hand wavy um, interpretation of what I'd expect. And this is actually what happens in practice. You can see here matrix completion with the depth one model versus depth two versus depth three. Each plot shows singular values through time. So with depth one, they all rise concurrently. So I don't get a low rank matrix, obviously. Depth one is trivial, just the unobserved entries don't move. And the reconstruction error is very uh, bad, it's high. If I add on another layer, you can start seeing the effect of singular values shooting up. I end up with a small set of large singular values and all the rest are much smaller. If I add another layer, the effect becomes much more potent. And now I end up with a few large singular values and all the rest are basically at zero. And so the reconstruction here is perfect, almost perfect. And here it's much better than trivial, uh, but adding another layer improved it. On the theoretical side, kind of a full blown theoretical result, we can show it for a simple case with just one observed entry. We can show there that if you have depth one, then the relationship between singular values is linear. So one of them will be a constant times the other. If you have depth two, the relationship becomes polynomial. So one singular value could be, for example, the square root of another. And if you work with depth three or more, then it starts becoming asymptotic, meaning that one singular value could go to infinity and the second one will not even pass some finite threshold. Okay? So bottom line is that depth leads to larger gaps between singular values. It leads to a low rank. And this is not something that was explainable by norms, but through this dynamical view, we can get a sense of what goes on here and we can get insights that comply with what happens in practice. And this idea has also found its way into practical applications. This is a work by Jan McCoon and his group at Facebook AI uh, from the recent uh, NeurIPS. What they did is employ this idea of a linear net implicitly minimizing rank uh, for designing some kind of um, novel auto encoding scheme. You can see, quote, rank is implicitly minimized by relying on the fact that gradient descent in multi-layer linear networks leads to minimum rank. And again, this kind of insight uh, is attainable through the dynamical analysis in places where the standard view that we're used to, like norm regularization, doesn't really um, pan out. Okay, so let's uh, conclude. To start with a recap, uh, I am arguing today that understanding optimization generalization in deep learning might not be possible through the lens of classical learning theory, and it might be beneficial to look at the dynamics. Uh, we tried to make the case by looking at deep linear neural networks. We analyzed their dynamics and saw that depth induces a preconditioner that promotes movement in directions um, already taken. And this allowed us to show, in terms of optimization, we derived a guarantee of efficient convergence to global minimum. This applies to any depth and any width. Uh, it's one of the most general guarantees of its kind that I'm aware of. And more surprisingly, we saw that depth can accelerate 
convergence, even though it introduces non-convexity and despite the fact that it doesn't give you any gain in expressiveness, it could still accelerate optimization. And in generalization, we saw that depth induces implicit regularization towards low rank that's different from any kind of norm. All of these results that we were managed to derive through the dynamical view uh, were difficult to derive with more classical um, tools, as we've seen. And just a word about the um, next steps. So linear networks are nice. Uh, they're interesting, an interesting theoretical model that already exhibits a lot of uh, rich phenomena. Um, but they're not the kind of models that people use in deep learning. Nonlinearity is critical. Yeah, that's what gives neural networks their expressive power. And we'd like to go beyond linear nets. So linear nets correspond to matrix factorizations. And in this language of decomposing arrays, I can draw this scheme. Every node here corresponds to a matrix. I chain them together, and they represent a, kind of an effective end-to-end -end matrix. And this language allows me to also describe factorizations of multi-dimensional arrays, of tensors. And I can factorize tensors in various ways. I can have a tree factorization or a train factorization. And it turns out that just like matrix factorizations correspond to linear neural nets, hierarchical tensor factorizations correspond to nonlinear neural nets of a certain kind. These are called arithmetic neural nets. Arithmetic means that the nonlinearity comes from products. So these are kind of some product uh, neural networks. And it turns out that there's an equivalence here. And the kind of tensor factorization you use, that determines the kind of architecture that you get for the neural network. If I use a tree factorization, I get a convolutional network. If I use a train factorization, I get a recurrent network. And these models are not just theoretical. Uh, they also work well in practice. Okay, they reach, for example, close to 90% on CPAR. It's not state of the art on CPAR 10. Not state of the art, but in my opinion, they kind of manifest the, the power of deep learning. And it turns out that many of the results that we've seen today actually carry over to these kind of models. And specifically, something that's uh, in the oven right now, and I hope will be out soon, is the dynamical analysis of gradient descent over these models and showing results on their implicit regularization. And kind of a spoiler is that they also, in some sense, minimize a rank. It's a tensor rank that they minimize. And I hope that these kind of models will um, allow us to reach a point where we have a deeper understanding of optimization generalization for a nonlinear neural network. And hopefully by that, we'll get closer to the goal of a deeper understanding of deep learning. So thank you. OK, thanks a lot. Any, any questions for Nadav? Nadav, are there any um, architectures that you studied that might correspond to like ReLU networks or Tanch networks? OK, that's a great question. So yes, if you take the correspondence that I showed in the last slide between tensor factorizations and arithmetic neural nets, if instead of tensor of standard tensor factorizations, you use something called generalized tensor factorizations, which is kind of tropical algebra with max plus, things like that, then it actually corresponds, it does correspond to value networks. So I do have a paper on that, studying the expressiveness, not the optimization. So I would say that that's kind of the, the next level beyond arithmetic neural nets, uh, is to take this framework and take it to, to value models. I, I don't know about 10 H, uh, though. Um, but I think values are probably interesting enough on their own. Right? Sure. Yeah, I agree. Any other questions uh, for Nadav before we take a break? OK, well, thanks again. Um, and we'll meet back in 15 minutes for Wei.